So what I'm going to do today, and this, uh, we're going to sort of this morning talk, and then after lunch we'll go out and have a bit of a field walk. Uh, I'm going to explain this concept that uh, I've been trying to drive around the world, at the reasons why uh, I've sort of got involved in this, and uh, what it's all about, the mechanics of what we call nutrition farming. So what we've seen, if we sort of look historically, uh, is that for 10 decades we've um, basically tried to solve our problems with uh, chemicals rather than, as we'll talk, the essence of this approach is the concept of getting back to root causes. Um, but we found you know, there's a lot of money to be made by just continuing to treat symptoms and that applies equally uh, in, in medical science and veterinary science and agriculture science and you know the bankruptcy of that symptom treating approach is probably best exemplified if we look at, uh, at medical science where the largest killer as of last month was heart disease with cancer breathing down its neck. The third largest killer until last month or maybe a couple of months previously was uh, stroke. Strokes become the fourth largest killer. The new number three is prescription medicine. So our medicine has become our third largest killer and that's kind of a little bit of a, a bankruptcy. If we look at you know, how this agricultural model evolved, we find that we, we had a guy called Justice, Dr. Justice von Liebig, who was a German chemist who burnt some plant matter, analysed the ash with the quite, quite crude technology they had at that point. Uh, and found that the ash largely consisted of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. He announced to the world that we could make, um, with some abandoned armaments factories, we could make NPK fertilisers and really it could do away with all the things we'd done previously with the animal manures, with the spelling, with the green manure crops and all the things that have been part and parcel of traditional agriculture. You can now get all that you wanted from a bag. So we kind of dumbed down nutrition. It's really important to understand the first cell that oozed from the Precambrian motion had 74 minerals and increasingly we're discovering that most of them, if, if not all of them, because there are no accidents in a perfect blueprint, and so we're discovering that, that basically they're all playing a role in tiny, tiny amounts. Um, but to, to dumb it down to just three things, recognising every time you take a crop off you take a little bit of everything and of course we've got the sort of 14, 15 minerals that we recognise but increasingly we're finding that selenium, the silica, uh, some of the things we don't test like cobalt and molybdenum are actually quite important in the big picture and we'll talk about those things later. So we, took, we dumbed it down to three minerals, took a little bit of all 74 off each season and not long after that, it was only really a, a decade and a half we started to see a lot more pest pressure than we'd seen previously, both disease and insect pressure. And you know, when you start looking at the new dynamic new science of plant immunology and you understand the roles of the trace minerals, many of which we'd neglected, uh, you know, they're, all this, they're all linked to the production of enzymes, many of which support plant immunity, you start recognising that you dumb it down, you pay a price and that's what we did. Uh, and with, again with the the way that we operate which is to you know, find the solutions with science, supposedly we came in with what we call the toxic rescue chemicals. So rather than getting back and saying why have we got these problems, we brought in a bunch, bunch of solutions and the, and the failure I, could get, I guess of that model has been that we've put more chemicals on since we started this, this is 10 decades now this experiment, what I call the chemical experiment and every year without exception globally we've increased the amount of chemicals, 14.7% last year, 14.1% the year before, 136 the year before that, this is increases in total chemical use. Every single year, without exception, there's been more put on and every year, without exception, there's more pest and disease pressure. So it's kind of like a hiding to nothing to throw more and more and get less and less response. It's actually the definition of an unsustainable model. So what we've seen is a bit of a wake-up call on that front. Just to get an idea of the scale of that wake-up call, I meet at ministerial level, often even with prime ministers in some countries. I train entire ag departments these days in Brazil, in quite a few of the Asian countries in India. Um, there really is major players like the Dole Corporation, for example, who are the largest fruit and vegetable producers. I spent um, quite some months training their scientists and their farm managers and the same with Driscoll's Berries who are a 3.5 billion dollar operation. I was over just a few months ago training all of their people. Uh, the interesting thing with Driscoll's and that is a bit of a kind of a, a wake up for some people, Driscoll's 3.5 billion, 1 billion of that is organics currently and people think of organics, the old school organics is you fall in a heap and at some point 
because you're getting higher premiums, um, you're going to catch up hopefully and you're going to do okay. So there's sort of a sacrifice in, in adopting organics. Well, that's, that's the old school concept of organics with the new kind of new generation hard science behind how you, there's really no excuse ever to do less if you were to go that whole hog. We talk about a biological approach which isn't actually organic. But if you were to step into the full organic reign, you, you're really not expected ever to do less. And so it's, it's actually, and in the case of Driscoll's, their organic division, their one billion of organics is actually outperforming. They're actually out yielding. Obviously they're making more money because of that 20, 30% premium, but they're actually out yielding they conventional. So their game plan is within five years, $3.5 billion worth of organics, because why wouldn't you if you're out yielding your conventional? So it's just driving home. I mean, in South Africa, the Woolworths supermarket chain, I trained all of their people. They launched Farming for the Future. It's been so successful that the other two supermarket chains have now approached me and said, look, can you uh, train our growers? We're losing too much market share to Woolworths, 540 stores as people flood to those stores to buy food with forgotten flavours, with extended shelf life and a lot less chemical contamination. So that kind of change and awakening is happening. But outside of, there's a couple of huge things that are impacting and driving this wake up call. One of them of course is the whole story of, of climate change and global warming and we'll talk a little more about that later. But equally important in that story uh, is our current rate of topsoil loss. There was a recent study, in fact the end of last year, um, that pretty much demonstrated that our current rate of topsoil loss, which is three to five tonnes per acre per year in the US and, well, the global figures, based on global figures, we've got 60 years and there's zero topsoil left. Now, we hit the wall way before 60 years. That's really important to understand. I mean, you can't feed 10 billion people with half of the topsoil that we've got currently. It's the thin veil that really determines, determines our ongoing existence. You can't say, oh, we'll feed 10 billion people with hydroponics. It's not going to happen and it's not feasible. The soil is incredibly important and we need a soil restoration initiative at governmental level in every country yesterday, essentially, with the, when, you, when you understand the seriousness of this. When we look at the whole story of global warming and climate change, we find that we've lost two-thirds of our humus with this uh, chemical extractive model. In the last um, 10 decades, we've gone basically from 5% as the average, and we're down now to 1.5% organic matter. Now, first thing to understand about carbon, and you might be familiar with this blanket of greenhouse gases, and carbon's the most dominant of those gases, First thing to understand is you can't make more carbon. It's the same carbon molecules that have been here since the very start of time and they cycle between three places. It's called the carbon cycle. So the carbon stored in humus, which is by far the largest storehouse, two or three times more than what's in, two and a half times more than what's in the atmosphere. So it's a carbon, it's carbon based life forms, us, plants, animals, or it can become a gaseous form and store in the atmosphere. And that's where two thirds of what was in the soil is now residing and that's thickening the blanket, trapping the heat and changing the world in which we live. Now, the seriousness of that without getting too grim, and it's, you can't really get much more grim than what I'm about to tell you, but the seriousness of that is much more serious than most people recognise. Just to give you a, a few little indications of that, and it doesn't mean I don't necessarily support the grim predictions, but Professor Guy McPherson is uh, a leading climate change scientist. He's probably in the top 20. He was in my home country of New Zealand just about two or three months back. And in primetime television, when asked the question, oh, well, you're a leader in this field, where do you think we're heading? He looked down the barrel of the camera and he said, I want you to all go out now and do everything on your bucket list. I'm sorry, but we've left it too late. In 10 years, there are no people left on the planet. Don't wait for nine years and 364 days because the shit hits the fan, and he did use that term way before then. So that's a real grim from one of the top 20 scientists. But then you look at someone like Professor James Hansen, a NASA scientist for 49 years of climate change science, and his unique claim to fame is that in 49 years of making predictions on a, on a daily basis, one of, the one of the sciences that involves more predictions than most, the man has never, ever been wrong. So that's, you know, that's almost, this Einstein was wrong hundreds of times, but every prediction he's made has been correct. So when he told us almost three years ago that we've got five years left, not till there's no world, but until 
it's basically a reversible and it's a shadow of what it used to be. That's when I started running, you know, 30, over 30 countries in a year and many people, I meet them everywhere who understand this equation that are doing, uh, have got this similar sense of urgency. So uh, it's a huge story. In your country last time round, um, I was here, I was, you know, the time before, I had a, a professor who headed a scientific think tank. He described it as the fairest and brightest of UK science and his group. And he confided over dinner that one in five of his members believe there's no people here by 2030. So understand that's only 13 years, uh, if they're right, but, but it's a hugely serious issue. Now, there is actually a solution to it, and what I'm trying to drive home, this recognition that farmers are the only people that can make a difference in this story. And when you build humus in your soil, you can't, make new, you can't say, oh, I made some more organic matter. No, you didn't. You can't make new organic matter. You stepped into the carbon cycle and sequestered what otherwise would have been part of that thickening blanket. So it's direct carbon sequestration when you fix carbon in the soil, when you change the way you farm, make a few changes and start building rather than the current model of losing organic matter on a yearly basis. Now the French are the first uh, science body at a governmental, uh, governmental level to recognise that and their primary initiative at the Paris Cl Climate Change Conference was called the 4 in 1000 initiative. Just out of interest, how many of you have heard of that previously? Only one, so it wasn't wasn't exactly broadcast very widely, um, amazingly. Uh, the 4 in 1000 initiative is a recognition at governmental science level that, if you, that we need desperately to incentivise our farmers to work towards this really lofty goal, but to work towards trying to build 0.4% organic matter on a yearly basis. And should that be possible, the French have demonstrated that even if you got halfway there, that within 10 years you've reversed climate change. So we're not just talking about trying to hold the temperature at 2 degrees, which all our talk about reducing emissions has been, OK, how can we hold it at 2 degrees? Well, understand it's 1.1 degrees so far, and the changes associated with that in every country I've travelled are uh, just massive beyond belief. Everyone's hurting, some in a, some in a huge way. Um, and, and two degrees isn't double one degree, it's called exponential. We've got no idea what two degrees look like because everything feeds on itself and it's going to be much more than double when we get to two degrees. So, you know, to say, oh, we'll try and keep it at two degrees uh, isn't really that satisfactory. It'd be much better if we could change that equation. And the only way that that's possible is to begin on a global level uh, pumping carbon back into the soil as humus and that actually can reverse the scenario. Um, the Americans, for example, pour out 8 billion of the 36.2 billion tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere. If you put 1% in just their cultivated lands, not the rangelands, which are not the grazing lands, which is easier to do in because the organisms that build humus like to be undisturbed, but if you were to do that, if you could build 1%, that pulls back 4.5 billion of their 8 billion, which is actually way more than what's needed to save the day. So, it's, you know, it's, as the French have shown, uh, it's possible that we can take within 10 years 402 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere and pull it back below 300. So now we're not talking about locking in two, we're saying we can go backwards, we can reverse and recover this situation. But the only way to do that is farmers. And so farmers suddenly become the most, not that they haven't always been the most important profession on the planet, but suddenly it's become even more important because there's no one else who can save the day except agriculture. So consequently as that recognition comes through, there's a bunch of changes that are set to happen and that's one of the, one of the reasons that we're seeing so many of these really large companies, even, like I said supermarket chains, really large, some of the largest players in the world, saying we've got to do it different before we're forced to do it different. So they've been smart, they've had all their economic advisors saying this is the trend, this is where it's heading and they're making those changes in advance. So, as I said, we've lost two-thirds of our humus. That's the lion's share of what's up there. Just so you know the figures, it's 250 gigatons, that's 1,000 billion tonnes since 1860 that we put up with all of our enterprises. Coal-fired power stations, industry, 7.4 billion lungs breathing CO2, uh, motor vehicles, that whole story is 250,000 billion tonnes. But during that same period, with that loss of two-thirds of our humus, it's 476 just from that story. It's almost double came from the soil and, you know, putting it back is a solution. You, know, you can't make new carbon, you stepped into the carbon cycle and sequestered it. Now, 
We mentioned this uh, arrangement of putting more and more chemicals on every year. At some point, every society has had to sort of address itself and say, okay, well, has what we've been doing been a success and evaluate that approach, in this case, their approach to food production. Uh, and and you usually ask the question, what does the next generation inherit? Well, there hasn't been a lot of research to look at that, and the very first study that I'm familiar with involved 1,400 school children in the US, uh, 700 from towns and 700 from country regions, and they looked at the 13 most commonly used farm chemicals. We all use them, the fungicides, the pesticides, the herbicides, the nematicides, the wormicide that most cattle producers pour down the throat, uh, and they looked at the presence of those chemicals in the bodies of the children. So they looked at hair tests, they looked at urine tests, they looked at tissue tests, which isn't that pleasant. Um, and to the horror of the researchers, they couldn't find one child, not a single child, who didn't have unacceptable levels of all 13 chemicals. So our inheritance to our children with this dumbed down nutrition and the chemicals that followed it uh, has been a leukemia ward in every city. The largest killer of kids is leukemia. There is no debates, there is no arguments about what drives leukemia, it's environmental chemicals, not just from our food, from a variety of sources, but there are two things we weren't told uh, in the chemical model and the saying, oh, it's not, no worries, we tested a guinea pig for three months and there's these things called minimum residue levels and you can get away with your four parts per million of diacine or three parts per million of glyphosate or whatever. The two things you weren't told, and perhaps we should have been told, the first of those is called the cocktail effect. What happens when you take, eat a, a tomato, which on average has 11 chemical residues in tiny amounts, but has anyone looked at what happens when you combine those chemicals? If you understand chemistry, you know that you take two chemicals, you make a third chemical very commonly. Uh, did you look at that third chemical? No, no one looked. There's never been any research. And so one of the billionaires that I've had contact with in the US is why he lost two, three wives to cancer and decided to fund uh, some research. So uh, he funded this research where they looked at the ten, uh, just 10 farm chemicals and combinations of those chemicals, just 100 of them. Now, 10 chemicals, the combinations are actually hundreds of thousands. Understand you can have 1% of one and 62% of another, and there's 10 of them, all with between one and 100%. So there are, uh, there are thousands upon thousands of potential varieties or variants, and he just looked at 100 combinations. And in a two-year study, this scientist found three new class three carcinogens, which means he proved that the new combination gave cancer to animals, and it's a little less ethical in that time frame to prove that it gives cancer to humans. But normally we accept that there's a probable serious risk factor if an animal gets cancer from the combination. So that's called the cocktail effect. The second, the second thing that we weren't uh, advised of was something called bioaccumulation, and that's what they tested in the children. Basically, the liver is your principal liver. It's actually your most important organ. It's more important in your body than your heart because it's charged with digestion. It's charged with a two-phase detoxification system, and that's pretty important in a world with 74,000 registered chemicals. So it's pretty much of an overworked organ. There's a book in Australia called The Liver Detox Diet, which is our biggest selling book for about seven years straight. And the liver specialist who wrote that book says no one ever comes over 40 into her office that doesn't need to do some work with their liver uh, when you do the testing because you know, the liver's got a hell of a job to do in this quite toxic world that we've created. So the liver is geared to take care of any natural contaminants. It might be uh, a snake bite or arsenic or mercury, all of which are natural things. And the liver says, yeah, I've got a pathway to begin neutralizing this contaminant. But the liver has not seen the man-made chemicals. It looks at them and says, gee, this is not a good thing. Uh, and so it pumps them off and stores them in our fat cells. And that happens with both humans and animals. Now, there's been quite a lot of work looking at confinement animals and testing their fat, and it really does make you think again about chewing on the fat of your bacon uh, because the same deal happens. You pump them with antibiotics and other chemicals because of the confined conditions, and the liver of the animal pumps it off and stores it in the fat. So the fat becomes the most toxic part of that animal. And uh, that's part of what they tested on those children. So that's called uh, bioaccumulation. It pumps the liver, pumps it off the fat to keep it out of the system so it doesn't affect organs. And it stores there and it builds and builds. Uh, and you get this accumulation. That, I mean, I had a farmer friend who actually became a famous writer. His name is Michael Rhodes, was a dairy farmer in Tasmania. He used to spray with a backpack scotch thistles, uh, just spot spraying. And if you ever had any experience with those aluminium backpacks, you'll know how often those seals leaked. And he would get, you know, headaches and so forth from the 2,4-D. Um, 
And then one day when he got a real bad leak down his back, his shirt was soaked, he was vomiting and convulsing and he made a call that he was going to become, uh, he was going to give up the chemicals and become an organic farmer. So he, was, he says he was the first organic dairy farmer in Tasmania in Australia. Uh, but unfortunately from the day that he made that call it stopped raining and it doesn't, I mean now we have the occasional droughts in Tasmania but boy it was pretty rare back then. And it got, things got worse and worse and he eventually had to sell his land and he signed his contract as the skies opened. He had just finished signing his names and the skies opened and the drought broke. Now you might have thought that was the worst luck that you could have ever imagined but in his case it didn't turn out to be the case and that's very often how the universe treats us. He headed off with his family, his, uh, his uh, two daughters and two sons uh, in a camper van to travel around and decide what he was going to do next because he was a third generation farmer and that's all he'd ever done. And while he was sitting there looking at various sites around Australia as he was travelling, he started thinking and he began putting a few ideas down on paper and, and he turned, you know, and then he realised he could write a book on this kind of, this kind of uh, inspirational ways that you can change the way you look at the world, I guess you could describe his work. Anyway, he's published in 23 languages and he's become a huge success story. Now, he was at one of my talks and I was talking about a new technology called far, not that new, but a, a technology called far infrared saunas the Japanese invented that pump into your fat cells where those chemicals are stored and pump them out. So it's a real good way if you've been farming and had a lot of chemicals to clean yourself out. Anyway, Michael said, oh, I'm going to buy one of those. So he bought one, puts it on his veranda, his wife Trini and himself and his daughter uh, hop into this, this 40 minute sauna session. It's got a little stereo in there and you've got a glass door and you can look out. And so they're sitting in there, 20 minutes in, Trini and his daughter rush from the sauna because the stink of 2,4-D is overpowering 35 years later. And for the next eight towels, Trini threw out the towel, gave him a holy old towel to use. She didn't want to wash it in the washing machine because there was so much smell of 2,4-D on it. So it took him eight towels to clear it out. That's called bioaccumulation. That's how your body handles chemical contaminants and you know lots of our farmers who have, who have actually gone and had sessions and these have the same thing where they can smell the chemicals as they come out of their fats. Anyway, that's called bioaccumulation. 